which we don't want emergence. Emergence is a very big word, has lots of meanings, and it's very important in many fields. And it's a very deep philosophical concept that we should all think about at some point. We should be worried about the meaning of emergence. So I'll discuss this. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So let's begin with. Uh, a uh, song, you may have heard the song. Let's just take the first four lines about little things. The little drops of water, little grain of sand, make the mighty ocean and a pleasant land. Then go on. So, but that, that's an interesting thought. The ocean is actually just lots of drops of water. But the ocean is much more than drops of water. And here is a story. So, this is a Buddhist text from the first century BC it's called Vilinda Parma. Vilinda's question. Title, uh, title of the, the book, of the text. So here's the story. So I'll just tell you the gist of the story. So there's a king called Milinda. He goes to his Buddhist monk, Nagasena, and he asks, Sir, what is your name? And then the monk replies, My name is Nagasena, but that's only a designation in common use. There is no permanent individual by that name. Then the king is astonished. He says, That is meaningless. You're saying there is no meaning to you. There is no Nagasena. Somebody could kill you and there will be no murder because there is no Nagasena. Then he asks, but then the king goes on saying, So what is Nagasena? You are saying it is just a designation. Is it your hair? No. Is it your nails? No. Is it your teeth? No. Then finally the monk replies, the monk says, uh, You are a very wealthy person, you are a king, you came in a chariot. You know, I am sure you are all familiar with chariots. You don't write one. So the king asks, the monk asks the king, you came in a chariot, please tell me what is your chariot? Is your chariot the wheel? He says, no. Is your chariot the spokes? It's not. Is your chariot the yoke? It is not. Is your chariot the, the other parts of the, you know, in, in each part of the chariot and asks, is this a chariot? And the king says, no. And what is your chariot? Is there a chariot or is there not a chariot? Does the chariot exist? So the king replies, Sir, I understand your point. It has all these parts, and that is why it comes under the term chariot. That's what you mean by chariot. And the monk replies, Yes, you understood the meaning correctly. Just because there are so many parts that are together in a certain fashion, we call it a chariot. Uh, so this is, of course, a philosophical story from a long time ago, but it's something we should all think about. Another So, in our day-to-day -day interaction, we think about so many things. We, I think of a podium, I think of a mic. Everything is composed of so many parts. But I, when I push a podium, I don't need to worry about all the molecules that are sitting here, that are bonded to something else, that are stuck with glue. I think of this as a podium. And that is a meaningful statement. I can use this to, you know, to stand, to hold, to rest. So we come up with so many constructs like this. We talk about society. So what is society? Society is just people so many people. Is it even meaningful to talk about society? How can we say something like a certain, so, certain section of society has these characteristics? This society will respond in that way. We do make these statements day to day basis. We all do. But the society is just many different things. So how does this acquire meaning? When is it meaningful? And so on. So you can talk about human beings, but human beings are just a collection of organs, organs are just a collection of tissues, tissues are just a collection of cells, cells are just molecules, molecules are atoms. Subatomic particles, quarks, maybe springs, or some other question mark. So everything here is actually composed of many things below. Everything is what we call an effective construct. It is meaningful to talk about molecules, because we know molecules exist, we know we can do things with them. And we can we can work with molecules while forgetting the fact that they're made of atoms. We don't need to worry about it. We know how molecules exist, we can operate. It. So we have this notion of effective construct. And this is true in all fields, not just in science, not just in physics. Every area, every area of life, we have these different constructs. Why is it meaningful to have this? It doesn't have to be this way. Nature doesn't have to be this way, that we have fixed objects that have been in spite of having many parts. So, uh, science is a very important question. We will see how we can understand this. So, you can think of things like a ball, a tree, a man, the earth, the sun. Anything else, everything else is an effective construct. It's actually composed of many parts, but if you give it the meaning, it behaves like one coherent entity, whereas it may have so many parts. In reality, it may have so many parts. Isn't it? It's an especially important question for science, physics in particular, because 
because we, we, we try to describe nature. We try to describe, we write a law for a ball that is bouncing. We, we write laws for the sun that will rise and the electric system. So but the sun itself is made of so many parts. Is it really meaningful to write an equation for the movement of the sun, the motion of the sun? So all science is in terms of effective constructs. So we have to think about some, at some point we should worry about how we can justify this. What, what is it that we are actually writing about? And how are we allowed to do this? How come we are still able to make the yeah. So, at least for physical laws, there are two important constructs here. There are two important <coughs> notions associated with this. So let's just quickly go through them with the analogy of the chariot. We already discussed the chariot in the king and the monk. So here's the chariot. So what is the chariot? It's a collection of parts typically it undergoes chariot motion. If you close your eyes, imagine a chariot moving. You imagine it moving in a certain way. The whole object moves, the wheels turn together. So it, it has some typical behavior. We all understand what a chariot does. So we, we have this notion of a chariot. So when is this a meaningful idea? So let's just ask a few questions. When is a chariot a meaningful idea? So here are some, some conditions. So first, it should have many parts. It should have all the required parts, wheels, spokes, axles, veins, yoke. They should all come together in a place. They should come together in the correct order. You should not have a wheel on the top. All of that should be present in the the chariot. And each element should have the correct properties. The wheel, for instance, should be round. You cannot have a square wheel in the chariot. The wheel should rotate. You should be able to understand how the wheel will behave. You know how a wheel behaves. It should have the correct properties. And all the elements in the chariot interact with each other closely. They influence each other very strongly. So one wheel cannot just roll away independently. If you push one wheel, the other wheel will also move. If they're, they're constrained together, they one pushes another, pushes another, and it's important. So all the elements interact with one another. Together, all of this, in the language of physics, we call this complexity. So complexity, uh, what we say is, there are many parts. We understand each part separately. We understand its behavior very well. For instance, here we understand what a wheel is. And we have all these parts that, are, that come together, that interact with each other, that influence each other. And that kind of system is called a complex system. And anything with that character is called has complexity. <coughs> so a chariot has a certain level of complexity. A chariot must have all of these elements, they should all interact in a certain way. It has a certain level of complexity, only then you can do this. That's of course a chariot, but any construct, any idea, any theorem, any law that we write, always assumes a certain level of complexity. So please think about this. This is not at all a trivial state. Not so easy. So if, I, if I write Newton's laws, I try to describe a ball that is bouncing. Already assuming a certain level of complexity. Assuming that the ball is a certain size, that many particles together, the ball's structural integrity is preserved. I throw it one shatter into pieces. It's not made of gas. All of those things are assumed in any state, any law. Electromagnetism, classic mechanics, electrical mechanics, anything you think. Assumes a certain level of complexity. That, that's something we usually don't think about. Um, okay, let's think. So, here's another important notion that we should understand. That's the notion of a scale. Let me, let's again go back to the chariot and try to think of uh, what it is. So, a chariot has a collection of parts. It typically undergoes this chariot motion as we discussed. It has a characteristic way of moving. When does this mean? In what conditions can they think of it as a chariot? Here are some conditions. First of all, the speed should be low enough. If you try to move a chariot at 300 km per hour, it will disintegrate. A chariot is only meaningful at a certain speed. Only some, some low speeds, terrestrial speeds that we need. It should It's only meaningful for weak disturbances. If I pull it by a horse, or you know, four people together pull it, push a chariot, chariot will move in the, in the correct fashion. If you take a hammer and a chisel and you you hit the chariot, it will just splinter away. It won't move. So you should only should disturb it weakly. You should not disturb it strongly. You should shoot a bazooka gun at the chariot. Wait, well, you can, but won't, it will not have the properties of a chariot anymore. It should, you should also only look at it for a reasonably short time period. Um, you cannot park your chariot outside, come back after 200 years, and then find the chariot. The chariot will just disintegrate. The chariot, party here to Mullah, is probably gone. Uh, and you should also have a certain length scale associated. If you try to observe a chariot from outer space, you will not see anything. You will not be able to even describe it. So, your resolution is too weak. A chariot moves over certain distances. 
Similarly, it should not see too closely. If you stand right next to the wheel, all you will see is the wheel wobbling. You will not see the chariot. So, every time I have to construct an idea like a chariot, I'm assuming certain speed, a certain strength of disturbances, a certain time scale, a certain length scale. All of these together define a scale. And similarly, in physics, everything that we talk about has a scale associated. Any concept, any notion that we have. We talk about a star. A star has a certain scale, a certain time, time scale, a certain light. We can talk about a ball, we can talk about a table, we can talk about you know, an atom, we can talk about an electron. They all have certain time scales, length scales, energy scales associated. Any law has this simplicity. So let's, let's see some examples. Let's so, so here is an example of a simple physical law. Suppose I have a ball and I try to bounce the ball and I want to explain the motion of it. If you all know, I can use Newton's laws to explain how a ball moves. So if, let's imagine for a ball, I can write initial velocity of my final position. Uh, so those are Newton's laws. They describe motion and they have a certain input. The input is mass, size, velocity, things like that. They go into Newton's laws. So we can all so, now suppose I, I glue two balls together, I stick them together. Glue. Two balls are attached to each other. Now I throw that pair, the balls that are stuck together, I throw them. Imagine I do that. And I want to describe their motion, I want to find out how far they go. I again use the same laws. It's just Newton's law. The same law will work for this. Except the mass is not twice the mass. It's the same, same laws explain a single ball. They also explain two balls. They also explain ten balls or hundred balls. Stick many balls together, the same laws will apply, except the parameters change. Instead of mass, you put the bigger motion. So uh, let's go to the next slide. So let, let's even think about this for a bit. Uh, so we talked about starting from a ball, so you increase the number of balls, two balls, ten balls, five balls. But let's even think of a single ball. What we call a ball is actually many objects together. Think of a tennis ball, there's an outer layer, there's an inner layer, there's air inside. Actually, a compound object has many things together. So, how do we describe such a ball so simply? How can I write one Newton's equation to describe something that has so many parts? It has a central part, many molecules inside. How can I do that? Uh, and that's a beautiful feature of physics. So, the equations of motion that describe the equations that describe motion is separated to different sectors. They reduce. We have equations for net motion, this overall motion of the ball. Rotation, something like this, the ball spins, or strain, or you know, the ball is squished. Say. So if I'm interested in net motion, I need not worry about these things. I, I can only write one equation for net motion. And as long as I'm considered I'm, I'm interested in net motion, overall motion of the ball, all I need to use is Newton's laws, and all the masses, every object there, the masses just add up. The equation for the collection of properties becomes one equation with the mass just added. That's a very beautiful property. So the same law, just Newton's law, applies, but just with a bigger mass. Okay, I hope you all can Please type, like. Okay, so what we can say about this in a more philosophical tone is that the same laws describe the components as well as the ball. The same Newton's law applies to one ball, it can also apply to 100 points. The same Newton's law applies to one layer of the ball, it also applies to four. In this kind of a situation, we'll say the scale has changed. We have one ball, suppose it was 100 balls. The scale has changed. However, the same law applies with a quantitative difference, not a qualitative difference. It's the same law, it's just that the numbers that go into the mass changes, the law makes qualitative difference. This we are all familiar with in our day to day lives. If you, if you, can, you know how to cook for one person, if you want to cook for 10 people, you just take 10 times 10 people. Maybe take it 10 times uh, one time, but still the same. It's the same procedure, just scaled up. That we're all familiar with in many points. But let's look at another example, also well known for this. Let's go to the next slide. So here is another pattern. So here is A.J. Thompson's experiment, the original sketch. It was 1897. So Thompson's discovery of electron. So he has a metal plate, some kind of plate with C over there. He has a metal plate, and what Thompson saw was particles were shooting out of the metal plate. Well, they're what we call electrons. So now we know that everything is made of electrons. Every object that we see, things we feel, all contain electrons. Let's just take a, a ball of metal. 
you had a ball of iron and copper, it, it contains lots of electrons. It's made of electrons. That, that we all know. However, so the statement we make is electrons make the metal. Electrons are a constituent of the metal. However, the laws that electrons obey are very different from what the, the ball itself obeys. The whole metal ball obeys Newton's laws. It can bounce it, it has momentum, it has velocity, all of the laws that I do. But the electrons that make it do not obey Newton's laws. They obey the laws of quantum mechanics. To give us another picture, this is a Edison in Germany in 1957. They used an experiment with the double slit experiment. You may have seen it in light. So, so they shot electrons through a filter that has two slits. And then if you, if you imagine if you're just shooting electrons and there's two slits, you might see like two strips at the end for the screen. But actually you see many strips. You see this is a bunch of like this. You see bands like this. So there are many, many electrons go here, many electrons go here. Then if you go in the middle. This is a characteristic property of waves. The electrons actually wave like waves, they don't wave like that. Uh, that is part of their quantum nature. They have wave, part, wave nature and particle nature. Whereas the ball we know has no wave nature. If I have a big metal ball, it's a particle. It waves like a particle. It doesn't float away like So, here is the situation. So, electrons are quantum mechanics. And they form materials. They are the building blocks of materials. But, if you say a metal ball, a metal ball obeys Newton's laws, which is very different. So there is a, a philosophical change here. There is a qualitative change. So the physical law changes qualitatively from one scale to another. You look at a single electron, the law is different. You look at a ball, a metal ball which contains 10 to the power 20 electrons, the, the law is different. You cannot use the same law to describe this. So we call this a qualitative change. The form of the law is changed. It's not just a number that is changed, the form of the law. So we can say that the physical law has changed qualitatively due to a change in scale as well as complexity. When you shoot single electrons, usually they are very high energy. But when you take a metal ball, it's very low energy. Energy scale is equal to one. Of course, the metal contains 10 power 20 electrons. Complexity is increased. Many electrons are bouncing off each other. Complexity is also increased. So by changing scale and complexity, you change the nature of the system. This is an example of emergence. We will talk about this. So, so here is a, this is not an example of emergence, but it's also a good thing to think about. So laws will change its case. That is something actual to expect. So let me give an example. If you have a particle that's moving with some force, you know it's described by Einstein's special theory of relativity. That is right. Especially if the object is moving at a very high speed compared to the speed of light. And it's described by Einstein's special theory of relativity. However, if that same object bumps up something and then comes off with a very slow velocity, it moves very slowly, then it's well described by Newton's laws. So historically Newton's laws were discovered first, Einstein's special theory of relativity came later. So the same ball at low speeds is described by Newton's laws, at high speeds is described by Einstein's theory. You might think the law has changed, but it's not true. It's not true because Einstein's relativity is always true. It explains slow balls as well as fast balls fast particles, slow particles. However, when particles are moving slowly, Newton's laws are a very good approximation to Einstein's theory. In this sense, you might think the law has changed, but actually the same law, always Einstein's theory. This takes a more simpler approximate form in some ways. So this is not a qualitative. This is a concrete example. Just these characters in mind. So it's different ways in this sense. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. So here, let's give a definition of emergence. Uh, this statement is very famous in my chair in many places. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. You put things together, the behavior you get, it's not just all the things together, but something more than the whole is more than the part. It's the appearance of qualitatively new laws and constructs. It can be changes in both scale and change both the scale at which you are doing something, also the number of parts. Both things. Uh, so let's just go through these quotes. The beautiful quotes by P. W. Anderson, the founder of modern things. It says, uh, the first quote is, the behavior, the behavior of large and complex aggregation of elementary particles is not to be understood in terms of a simple extrapolation of the properties of a few particles. Instead, at each level of complexity, entirely new properties are there. And understanding the new behaviors requires research, which is as fundamental to the same So you put things together, you get new laws. You have to study them. 
you just know, if you know what a single electron does, you cannot predict what a metal does. So that's a new area, you have to study it equally fundamental. Uh, here is another beautiful example. In this book, it says, we are so accustomed to the rigidity of solid bodies that it has to realize that such action and resistance is not built into the laws of nature. It's strictly a consequence of the fact that energy is minimized in the case So essentially what is referring to is the rigidity of solid bodies. So let's go to the podium again. If I push the podium from one corner, it all knows it's a solid, this podium is very steady. Imagine a more bobbing podium. If I push it, that end will immediately move because it's a solid. If I push this, it moves. It's rigid. But really, I only apply the force here, but that the particles there move, objects there move. That looks like action at a distance. I'm acting somewhere here, and I see a consequence very far. Of course, it doesn't violate any relative rules. But that is a consequence of rigidity. This has the property of solidness, where distances between entities are fixed. That's why you have to stop. That itself is an emergent problem. It's because you have so many particles, they're all constrained, they're all touching each other. So you can push one into the other into so that's, the, that's a very nice example that we should all keep in mind. A solid is, a, is an emergent phenomenon. There is no reason to... You might not guess that if you put many things together, it become a rigid body which preserves its shape. That's something not easy. Okay, so that's big philosophical introduction. I'll, I'll give you some simple examples from our recent research. I hope so, my student and some collaborators. Where if you look at simple magnetic systems, and we can illustrate how emergent properties how, how you can get a few properties by just putting things together. Hopefully it will be, be clear. It's a very simple, it's just some three steps, four steps you can get to emergent properties. So I'll write the same course here. Okay, so for this purpose, I'm going to consider some objects like this. So these are um, so these are common motifs in many, many magnets. Any interesting magnets like these shapes as building blocks. They are built by putting many rods together, many triangles together, for many tetrahedral. So this, this is a tetrahedron. It's a shape with four vertices and four faces. It's a regular tetrahedron, like a pyramid. And these are very common things. So, we, we have magnets. So what that means is, at every tip, at every vertex, so here, for instance, there are four vertices. Every vertex, we have a spin. The spin, for the purpose of this talk, is just an arrow in three dimensions, which has a fixed length. So, it's something like this. I brought some small tools to demonstrate this. So, so you can, a spin is just something like this. It's an arrow. It has a one end, which has a tip and a root. This is the root of the arrow, that's the tip. A spin is just something like this. You can point in any direction. The origin is fixed. It's it somewhere else points. Let's just think of that. It's just a vector in 3D as a spin. That's enough for the purposes of this one. Okay. So in this family of systems, you take a rod, a triangle, or a tetrahedron, they have a very nice property. This is as follows. If you look at the energy. So at every point you have a spin. For instance, say you have four spins, you have four vectors. This vector can point in some direction, that can point in some direction, some direction, some other direction. There you have three spins, there you have two spins. In each case, if I ask what's the energy of the system, the energy is just the sum of the spins, whole spin. I'll illustrate what that means. It's a vector sum. For those of you who understand vector addition, you know what this is. You just take all the, so here for instance, n is 4. Just take s1 plus s2 plus s3 plus s4. Four vectors, add them, and square. That's the energy. Here you add three spins, and you square. Uh, that is a very simple property that allows us to explain this. Let's do it. So the lowest, so the energy is given by sum of the spin whole squared, which is a number. Uh, the lowest value of energy is zero. Imagine the sum is zero, that's when this energy is given. If you add, after all this, this is a positive quantity, something squared, the lowest value you can have is zero. And the vector sum is written Spanish. Let's just think, do some nice geometrical exercises. How many ways can this be achieved in each case? If you go through these cases, it's really simple. Let's go. So please feel free to stop me anytime right? So let's uh, let's consider this example. So this is just a diamond, just two spins. Imagine you have two spins and you have that same condition. You have spin one spin there, one spin there, and the energy is the sum of the spins whole square. And when will that be minimum? It will be minimum if the sum is zero. 
Yes, it is possible. I'll show you. So, the sum of spins whole square is the energy. So, here is a simple example. Take the first spin to point up, second spin to point down, S1 plus S2 is 0. Sir, it's tensory about the spin, right? Sorry? It's tensory about the spin, right? It's tensory about the spin. Yes. So, there can be other factors which is contributing to the energy, right? There can be other factors. So, in these systems, the spin is only the energy phase. Once you might imagine that the triangle distorts, or the temperature in dust, those things don't happen in this. I suppose that's what you're asking. So here, spins are the only relevant variables, and there exists real systems. Okay, so I can minimize the energy. So for any of you here, if you're not familiar with vector addition, it's just something like this. I start with one spin. This is my, my initial point. I say I, I place the first spin in some direction like this. Then the second spin, I have to start from here and then I have four points in some direction. Now the total spin is simply I start from the original point and go to the end point. <coughs> now if the total spin has to be zero, I have to have something like this. I go from here to there and then I come back. Then I come, come back to the same point. Then that is the lowest energy point. Okay. Now let's ask the question, how many ways can I do this? I could have placed the first spin in any direction. I could have placed the first spin anywhere. The second spin will just go sit in the opposite direction. So I can place the first spin in whichever direction. Doesn't matter. The second spin always gets fixed. So how many ways are there? It's just a, it's equal to the number of points on a sphere. If you point the first spin in any direction on a sphere, the second spin is fixed. These are all the low energy states of this diamond. Okay. So uh, you say that the low energy states are like the surface of a sphere, the surface of a sphere, the surface of a sphere, and the surface of a sphere is two-dimensional. So if you take any particular, if I say this is my low energy configuration, I can move it in two ways such that I'm still, I still preserve this tension. I can move it like this or like that. There are two degrees of freedom. So we can ask what is the low energy behavior of this kind of piece? So I'm just giving a qualitative picture here. It also works in mathematics. Yes? So the qualitative answer is this. So at low energies, I think this is two spins with some energy. It actually behaves like a particle moving on a sphere. You can see what, what is the reason for that? The reason is that all the low energy states of the two spins map to point, points on the sphere. I just fix the first spin and the second spin goes there. So the position of the first spin on the sphere is that represents the state. How many states are there? There are as many as there are points on the sphere. So the low energy properties of a diamond actually look like a particle moving on we can show mathematics. So, so this is a, a, a very simple example of reminders. So you have two spins, you put them together with a certain energy, or they, they couple to each other in a certain way, and the resulting object behaves like a particle on a sphere. <coughs> that is something different from what you start with. Just two spins, you get something. So let's do one more example. Let's do, uh, let's perhaps skip this. Let's do here is another example. So suppose I have three spins on a triangle. Now my condition again is I have three spins and their sum has to be zero. I have to add the three spins to get zero. How can I do that? You can think about it a little bit. So let me just, before I demonstrate with these states, you can just look at this. So if I have three vectors and they should add to zero, all three vectors should be in the same thing. And one of them likes here, the other two should like. So this angle should be 120 degrees. This is 120 degrees, this is 120 degrees. That's the only way three vectors can happen. So let's, let me just demonstrate these sticks. Hopefully you'll see. So let's say first spin I place it this way, some, some arbitrary way. The second spin, I should start from where the first spin ends, and it has to go somewhere there. Now I've just added two spins. The third spin, I start from where this started, and it has to come back to the same point. Only when the energy is zero, only when total is zero. The only way to do it is always how many plays of time. You cannot do something like this. If you do anything else, you will not get three spins added. Okay? I'm just taking three needles, putting them end to end. If I say I start from here, I go here, I go there, and I come back to the same point, then I will form an equilibrium triangle for whatever reason. There is no other way. So you can ask me, how many ways can I do this? So, 
here's an, here it is a demonstration. I can make an equilateral triangle like this. I can make an equilateral triangle this way, that way, and in I can rotate this in the So if you imagine this, if you think about this a little bit, you convince yourself that the all possible such low energy states are just equivalent to rotations. You start from one one uh, equilateral triangle and you rotate it. So that's already a very interesting property. So the low energy states of this are all just rotations. So how many ways, do I, how many have, do I have? It's the number of rotations that I can do in three dimensions. So let's move to the next slide. That actually tells us a beautiful mathematical property. This system of three spins on a triangle, this energy, has these low energy properties. At low energy, it looks like a rotating sphere. Okay, and what I'm saying can be said and mathematically very precise terms, I'm just giving you a qualitative picture. So imagine I have a sphere, it has no special direction, it's just a uniform sphere, but it, its center is fixed, but it's allowed to rotate. And you ask what are the energies of that object? If you look at the system of three spins, it will have the same energy, it will have the same property. So the system of three spins, this kind of a constraint behaves like a rotating object. Why does it behave like a rotating object? Because it likes to preserve this condition of having equal zero spin. It's just like the maybe a simpler way to example, a simpler example to think about it is the wheels of a chariot. Why don't the wheels of a chariot just break away? One wheel goes there, one wheel goes there. Because it costs a lot of energy to break the wheel off the axle. The wheels are stuck to the axle, it costs a lot of energy. But because of that constraint, because the energy is low, of course if you kick it very fast, it might break. But in usual circumstances, the wheels will move together and it will look like one, one chariot. The same way, the three spins together look like a rigid object, a, a, rigid, a rotating sphere that's just rotating. Okay. Okay, let's maybe have one more example and then we we'll finish up. Sure. Uh, let's, 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 or okay, let's maybe go back to this. So here is a nice documentary example. So, this, Maybe you cannot imagine if you are mathematically very really talented. So imagine I have spins, but the spins are two-dimensional spins. My spins are only allowed to be in the XY plane, in this plane. They're not allowed to come out like this. Now I have three spins, and their sum should go to zero. How can you do that? You must have three spins. Again, you must form a, an equilateral triangle. But the triangle must always lie in the plane. You're not allowed to rotate like this. If you come out, that you, that you break the condition. I mean, all spins must be in the plane. The triangle can only be like this. And then you can rotate this within the plane. You can have all the rotation. Actually, if you think about it a little closely, there is another set. There are two families. So you imagine this condition. I put my first spin this way. Then the second spin I turn right. So this, of course, 60 degrees. Equilate triangle, 60 degrees. I turn right, and then again I turn right. So one, two, three. Take this object and then I can rotate it in the plane. They're all they're all equal in this case. Here is another example. I put the first thing here, but instead of turning right, I turn left. One, two, three. So please convince yourself, think about look at these two pictures. If I rotate that object, I can never get this. If I rotate it inside the plane. If I rotate it out of the plane, I take this, I flip it over like this, I will get this object. I flip it over, I'll get this. But I'm not allowed to flip off. I'm, 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 only, I'm only supposed to stay in the plane. Then I can start with this, I can do any rotations. I can start with this, I can do any rotations. But they do not mix. It's a separate concept. So the model of the story is, it's three spins, two D spins. This behaves like a circle because I can rotate it in any way. It can be like 360 degree angles. This behaves like another circle. It's two disjoint circles, two separate circles. Let's go. So the, this system of three spins, two D, creates like a particle that lives on two separate surfaces. This particle can be here or there, but inside it is. This can be made more precise. If you work it out. Actually, it's also quantum by so it take only quantized energy on this piece. This we can show. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So here is so if any of you have seen quantum mechanics, this is the only data I'll show. Here is some example. So you take these three spins, the spins are actually quantum spins, there's a spin quantum number, S789, like any value. And you look at the energy spectrum of this, 
see that there is the lowest empty state, there are actually two points, W, D, and S. Two possible low empty states. And the first exact state is fourfold, four states, four, and then four states, four states, four states. Okay. Don't worry about it too much, just the same as a particle that's living on two circles. If you have a particle that's living on two circles that obeys a lot of quantum mechanics, then it will be the same. If you look at the entities also, it's squares. So 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 26. They're all squares of natural numbers. So one square, two square, three square, four square. Okay. That's another property of a particle moving in a circle. That is a quantum particle moving in a circle. So, let's do the next slide. So, here is maybe the final example. Let's stop with this. This is truly illustrates emergence. So, I, I was very excited about this. So, let me tell you about this. So suppose we have a quarter of a tetrahedron and four spins, four vertices, one in each corner. And this, these are 3D spins. Spins can point in any three direction. Now I ask, the total spin should be zero. How many ways can I do? So just please think about this for a minute while I take out the next thing.
Yes. Yes. So two two different things are happening. So uh, so the timer in timer the number of spins is not in three spins. Quantum bar has four spins. It's a definite event. The timer is a timer. That that is the thing. The number of spins has increased. The space of spins has also increased. In the 2D spins, spin is only allowed to be in the plane. Now I have said the spin is allowed to be in any way, point in any Both things. Thank you very much. 